So um, it looks like we maybe have a few participants. Uh, we're going to wait uh, till one o'clock exactly to start the presentation. Um, but thank you for those of us, those of you who are joining um, this webinar on skeletal muscle physiology and regulation of myogenesis. Uh, I don't know very many jokes to entertain you while we wait, <laughs> but uh, we are, you are in the right place if that is the lecture you are hoping to hear, and we will get started at right at one o'clock. In the meantime, you'll probably hear the background noises of New York City, although they are significantly reduced in this time of quarantine and COVID-19. Um, but hopefully there won't be too many sirens or uh, things that uh, distract us or distract me while I'm speaking today. Um, that does happen a lot, lots of background noise. <laughs> so you can enjoy the sounds of a quiet New York while we wait for our seminar. I can also tell you that this picture uh, of my dog jumping into my parents' swimming pool, I was looking for something happy and outside of the concrete jungle of New York, which I've been in, have not left for many, many weeks now, um, which in the grand scheme of things is a very minor thing to complain about. But when I was putting this talk together, I wanted uh, something to uh, bright and cheery while also highlighting muscle and exercise of dogs and so I love this picture of my dog. Um, we actually taught her to jump off the diving board and go after her um, floaty in the water and uh, she loves it. She gets super excited. Um, again we will be starting right at one o'clock. You're in the right place if you're here for the webinar on skeletal muscle physiology. Um, right now, we're just giving everybody a chance to sign on, uh, but we'll be starting at one o'clock. All right, so I don't know any jokes, so I phoned a friend. Let's see if I can find some good ones. <laughs> uh, why did the rooster cross the road? Because he wasn't a chicken. Why did the baby chick cross the road? because it was take your child to work day. <laughs> These are terrible. <laughs> oh man. Why did the fish cross the road? To get to its school. Ba -dum -bum. Luckily you only have three more minutes before we start our webinar. <laughs> If you've just joined us, we are in the right place if your hope is to hear about skeletal muscle physiology and regulation of myogenesis. I will be giving that webinar starting right at one o'clock. So we're just giving everybody some time to get into the webinar and be ready to learn. All right, another minute or so, and we'll get started. 
Hopefully everybody is doing okay. That's very unique time. Alright, so it's one o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and get started. First, I'd like to thank everybody for joining me this afternoon for this webinar. I know that again, these are some pretty unique times. So hopefully having some opportunities like this help kind of keep us connected and, and keep us normal as we continue to get our CE and, and communicate in our field. So if you're joining us today, hopefully you're in the right spot. My plan today is to talk about skeletal muscle physiology and the regulation of myogenesis. My name is Dr. Carmela Nugent Britt. I am a veterinarian and I'm also certified in canine rehabilitation therapy. I am at the end of my second year of residency in canine sports medicine and rehabilitation here at the Animal Medical Center in New York City. I will apologize in advance if you happen to hear some sirens go by. Uh, that is, although it's much quieter right now than it normally is, there still is the chance for that. I think it's always nice to know who's speaking to you when you are hearing a presentation. So I wanted to give you a little bit of my background. Um, again, I'm a veterinarian. I trained at Ross University and then did my clinical year at NC State in Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, and then did a rotating internship at a small animal practice in Raleigh, North Carolina, uh, and then went on to do my residency. Before that, way back when, a uh, long time ago, I had the amazing opportunity to work with John Sherman. He is one of the pioneers in rehabilitation for animals. He started his clinic before really in the early stages of the certification programs and well before any sort of residency program had started. Uh, I had been given a job, I uh, was working at a research company who was dependent on USDA grants for their research. They didn't get their second phase funding. And so they gave me the opportunity to continue to work for free or um, I could leave. And so at that time in my life, I was unable to work for free, which worked out perfectly because Dr. Sherman was hiring. Uh, I had never worked in rehab before, as most people hadn't at that time. Uh, the pictures in the middle are my favorite patient and also my very first rehab patient that was secret. She was a field trial lab who uh, had been born or stepped on and had some spinal and pelvis um, malformations that uh, it limited her ability to walk in the back end. And so she was my first patient. She was a puppy when she came to us and we rehabilitated her. She had some incontinent neurological incontinence as well as the fact that she was a puppy and not house trained. And she basically grew up in our clinic. And despite the fact that she got multiple baths a day for having soiled her kennel, we still loved her dearly. She went on to not obviously compete competitively, but Dr. Sherman actually sewed a brace to help keep her, uh, her back straight and her legs working well. And she went on to retrieve many, many a bird um, in practice practice and in the field and had a great life. Um, so that was my first step into rehab and what kind of brought me to where I am today, although that path was not a very straight line, but that's okay. So that's me. Um, what I'm going to talk to you today about is uh, skeletal muscle physiology. We're going to start with that, just kind of dusting off the cobwebs from our anatomy and physiology courses, a review on the function and how that form dictates dictates function and the importance of that. Then we're going to delve in a little bit deeper into myogenesis and the factors that regulate myogenesis and impact your phenotype, your muscular phenotype. And that's going to be a little bit probably nitty gritty. I tried to keep it as superficial as possible, but it is important to, to know those things. I'm certainly not a biochemist, but uh, you know, again, part of my training is to understand that muscle physiology. So I'm here to share it with you today. And then we'll wrap up with a discussion on why we care. So why, why are these mechanisms important? And one of the big signaling pathways that we're gonna talk about is myostatin. And the reason for that is it's been indicated as a biomarker in disease. And then we'll wrap up with some current research that's going on. 
so again, here we are going to dust off those cobwebs. We're going to look at our skeletal muscle structure and function. So on the left hand side of our screen, we have a muscle belly. So the muscle belly is made up of numerous myofibers. Um, these are all bound by connective tissue, the epimysium that surrounds the entire muscle. You have your paramecium, which is going to surround each fiber bundle, and then your endomecium, which surrounds each independent muscle fiber. Within this network, there are capillaries, nerves, and lymphatics, and they pass through the tissue sheets to the endomycin. The endomycin is very rich in capillaries and is highly sensitive to vasomotor tone. And then if you look at the other side of our screen, we have our muscle fiber. So this is the um, subcellular structure that contributes to contractile function of a muscle. Here you have your myosin and your actin, which are your thin and thick, or thick is myosin and thin is actin filaments. Tropomyosin and troponin are also in these, um, and that is your functional contraction of the cell. So it's called your sarcomere. And then as a general reminder, your satellite cells are going to be the progenitor muscle um, cells that act in tissue repair. So again, this is going to be sort of a, a review of things we all know. We probably maybe don't remember the exact mechanisms, but it's important to understand how a muscle contraction occurs. So remember that you're going to have a motor neuron that stimulates a nerve action potential. It's going to pass to the neuromuscular junction. We're going to have release of acetylcholine because of the change in resting membrane potential, which will then open up your sodium gated channels and you have an influx of calcium into the cell, into the muscle, um, to the level of the sarcoplasmic plasmic reticulum. So once that happens, the next phase is the actual muscle contraction. And so this is happening through that sliding filament theory using the cross bridge formation. So the calcium binds to the troponin, which changes the shape of the trophomycin. That change in shape of the trophomycin exposes the actin binding site. So once that becomes available to the myosin head, the cross bridge is formed. At that formation, you have release of an inorganic phosphate, which increases the bond strength. There's the sirens I told you you would hear. Um, the uh, activated myosin has bound. You have the release of the phosphate. And then, then the next step is that ADP is actually released, which causes that myosin head to pivot. So that's that sliding filament. When ATP rebinds to the myosin, you have detachment of that head. And then at the next stage is that act, the activation of the ATP causes the uh, ATP to be hydrolyzed into the inorganic phosphate and the ADP. It allows the myosin to become reactivated and its head is returned to the cocked position. So this continuous cycle and, and uh, sliding of those filaments is allowing the sarcomere to shorten and that is what your muscle contraction or that is the cause of your muscle contraction. So now that we've sort of talked about skeletal muscle at a cellular level, we're going to now broaden our scope and start talking about skeletal muscle structure at a, a more um, generalized term or category. So in our mammals, we look at broadly two types of muscles, primarily type one and type two. Your type one are your more slow oxidative fibers. So use your slow twitch, they're highly oxidative. Because they're oxidative, they have high levels of myoglobin, high levels of mitochondria, they fatigue slower, and they are narrow in, in diameter. Your type two, again broadly, are going to be the larger in diameter. They are going to have a moderate amount of mitochondria and their amount of the, or the degree that they fatigue is dependent on, you know, the type of type two that it is. Um, but these are generally going to be your fast twitch, your glycolytic fibers. What's important to note is that we no longer really think about these type two muscles as one type of fiber. Our updated and improved immunochemistry techniques have allowed us to be able to identify subtypes. So as you can see on this chart, there are actually subtypes of type two fibers. In the dog, there are even more subtypes. They have the dog type two, they have a, a combo or a hybrid of type one plus type two A. They also have this type two um, X fiber. Um, and what changes among those fibers is the degree of oxidative capacity. 
what's really fascinating and makes me love my job and the animals that I work with is that all canine fibers are high, are moderately to highly oxidative, even the type two, which is why they are such extraordinary uh, animal athletes. Your type one and type two muscles tend to have different purposes. Now all muscles have one type or the other. They do tend to have both, but they may have one that is more predominant in, in a typical, typical muscle belly. Your type one are your postural muscles. So those are the muscles that are more susceptible to atrophy as opposed to your type two, which tend to be more of the antagonistic or resistant to atrophy. Your type two are the ones that we think of generating power and speed. I've listed a few muscles that have been uh, studied and, and the type of or predominant fiber has been identified. If you look at our vastus intermedius and our rectus femoris, which is really going to be your quad muscles, those have predominantly type 1, so 50% or up to 65% as in the case in the vastus intermedius. Your triceps, however, only has about 30% um, of type 1. So that speaks to the function of that muscle and what it does on a daily basis and what its purpose is. We'll talk a little bit later about how that can be changed. So what this skeletal muscle does, and I will apologize and say that obviously there are other types of muscles, but for the purpose of this lecture, we are very focused on skeletal muscle, so I won't be discussing the other types of muscle. But skeletal muscle comprises about 40% of the body. In humans, we use about 50 to 75% of our proteins are, are in the muscle and used for muscle. The muscle's job is really to convert chemical energy into mechanical energy. It does this for posture, movement, respiration, and circulation. It also does play a role in regulation of metabolism. So you can have, you can take amino acids through oxidation from muscle and from skeletal muscle, although that's not ideal. In a well-nourished animal, you would actually want this to occur if they were depleted in protein, they, you would want this to occur in the liver through transamination. In fact, if you have 30% loss of muscle mass, that can impair respiration, circulation, and immune function. So what determines muscle mass? I really love these two pictures. The Basset Hound is actually from the AKC breed standard photo. And then we have this amazing field trial lab who is clearly very well muscled and very well defined. And you can actually see all of its muscles outlined, um, which is you know very, very different than our little Basset Hound. So what determines the muscle mass and why are these two animals so very different? So there's some external factors. We consider physical activity and nutrition to play a role in muscle hypertrophy. We also know that hormones such as IGF, testosterone, growth hormone, cortisol, they can also contribute to some degree to muscle and protein synthesis and turnover. Certainly there are genetics. So some, uh, as we just saw, the Basset Hound is not a particularly muscular breed. The lab isn't necessarily either. When we think about muscular breeds, you probably think about Roddy's or um, the Staff Staff American Staffordshire Ter Terrier, the, the pit bull, but that particular lab is obviously well-trained. Um, and then all of these sort of are playing a role in the synthesis and degradation of proteins, which is actually a very tightly regulated process in the body. So when you think about your external factors, one big thing is going to be exercise. So endurance versus strength training and how do we really affect muscle size? So there's a difference between these two types of training. So endurance is considered to be a relatively low intensity muscle contraction that happens repetitively compared to your strength training, which is a limited number of contractions that happens against a high mechanical load. Typically, your response to that type of strength training is relatively slow. You're not going to become a buff bodybuilder in a week or two, but you may have some improved um, endurance if you continue to exercise uh, your endurance training. And let's talk a little bit about what that looks like. So in terms of endurance training, you're not really affecting the muscle fibers, uh, the number of the muscle fibers or the cross-sectional area. What you are affecting is their oxidative capacity. And usually you can get up to a twofold increase. What this does is increase mitochondrial density, oxidative enzyme activity. It also increases the uh, fatty ability to use fatty acids and efficiency with which we use fatty acids and carbohydrates. 
Interestingly enough, the oxidative capacity of both types of muscles are affected. So you can improve your oxidative capacity of your, of your type two, even um, you know, above what they already have. When you're looking um, at changes in muscle fiber, so we talked about the triceps having about a 30% uh, type one. Well, you can actually change the type of fiber uh, present in a muscle by changing, by doing endurance uh, training. So in one study, there were dogs that were run basically five times a week for 55 weeks, and then biopsies were taken, and they looked at the muscles and the triceps, uh, and they found that there was an increase in their oxidative uh, type 1 muscles, and also they found that in the thoracic and uh, cervical spinal muscles. So that's pretty significant. Compare that to your strength training, which is going to be a different type of muscle effect. So you have an increase in your glycolysis and your glycogenolysis, which, and then you have an increase in your muscle strength, which is essentially increasing the cross-sectional area of your muscle. This cross-sectional area is directly related to the tension that that muscle is capable of exerting. And you get this effect by overloading the muscle. So that's how you improve the cross-sectional area. Again, this can affect both types of muscles. So while it affects your type 2 more, you can have cross-sectional increases in your type 1 as well. The primary mechanism for increasing your cross-sectional area is going to be through hypertrophy rather than hyperplasia. And that's important to know, although there is some hyperplasia that happens. The other part of exercise in both types is that you have improved synchronization of your motor neuron and your motor unit. So that discussion that we had about the release of acetylcholine and the calcium influx and the propagation of that nerve sing signal. So that's improved in this, uh, in this trained muscle. Certainly nutrition plays a role as well as an external factor. So you have your oral and IV nutrition, which can promote protein synthesis. You, we also know that insulin has effect on muscle protein synthesis, but it is dependent on the availability of amino acids. Also, the anabolic response is stimulated by protein synthesis rather than the decrease in, pro, or, uh, decrease in protein breakdown. So that's important to note. One other important thing about nutrition is that an appropriate balance of macro, macronutrients is important and necessary to build muscle. This does include the presence of essential amino acids within the body. Remember that we don't really store protein. Uh, a combination of both protein, uh, amino acids, and, and uh, carbohydrates is best, especially in the post-training uh, period of recovery. So that's sort of our external factors and the things that we can do to improve muscle or affect muscle. There are internal factors, as we discussed, insulin certainly plays a role by inhibiting protein breakdown and in the presence of appropriate nutrition, it can increase protein synthesis. We think that cortisol and testosterone and growth hormone have more minor influences on protein turnover, but they certainly play a role. And then there is the cellular level where we are regulating myogenesis. And there's four key players that are part of signaling pathways that we identify as part of muscle regulation. Myostatin, ubiquitin, IGF-1, and mTOR are the big ones. So your body can have two responses to these factors. You can either have hypertrophy or atrophy. This is essentially a, a net balance between anabolic and catabolic proteins. So you have free amino acids in your blood and those can be used to synthesize proteins. Obviously not all proteins in your body make muscle. There are certainly enzymes and immune function and other proteins that are made from the free amino acids, but for the purpose of this lecture, we're talking about the synthesis of proteins to make skeletal muscle. So things that you can do to cause hypertrophy in your muscle. Well, you can do resistance strength training. So we just talked about how that impacts your cross-sectional area and creates hypertrophy. In humans, they can also use growth hormone or do use growth hormone, uh, maybe not legally, to help improve muscle. And again, that muscle hypertrophy is really gonna happen through two mechanisms, either through hyperplasia or hypertrophy. And hypertrophy is the primary mechanism. When I think about all the things that can cause atrophy, that list is much bigger than those that can cause hypertrophy. So you can think of malnutrition, you can think of disease, either uh, injury or, or, I'm sorry, disuse, either through injury or pain. You can have neurogenic 
atrophy. You can have sarcopenia, cachexia, certainly sepsis. Burns is a big thing that they look at in people. Certain diseases are predisposed to causing atrophy, things like diabetes, cancer, kidney failure, hypoadrenocorticism, and then administration of glucocorticoid therapy can also cause atrophy. So it seems like perhaps the, the, the cards are stacked against us in terms of what we can do to create hypertrophy versus what can cause atrophy. And that's why this regulation of myogenesis is so tight within the body. As a general reminder, not to bore anyone with some of the science that we probably don't need to know anymore, what we're really talking about in regulation of myogenesis is DNA that's, that's transcribed into mRNA. That mRNA is then translated to produce proteins, and those proteins have a purpose. So that's really what we're talking about. So we'll start with mechanisms of hypertrophy and the signaling pathways that regulate those. IGFR is, or I'm sorry, IGF-1 is a big regulator of protein synthesis. It does this through a complex signaling cascade, as you can see here on the slide. Basically, it is um, upstream of some of the proteins that create ribosomes that promote synthesis of muscle. It's stimulated by load of the muscle. So by that contraction, that resistance training can stimulate an increase in IGF-1. The other part about IGF-1 that's important is that it blocks some cells, the FOXO proteins, that are actually responsible for cell death. And so in addition to promoting protein synthesis, IGF also has a role in inhibiting protein breakdown. We suspect that it is likely through an autocrine or paracrine, effect, paracrine effect that this occurs rather than a systemic effect. We think that because of some of the studies that have done with direct infusion of IGF. We also think again that it's, it may, because it is sensitive to load, it may play a role in muscles adaptation to overload. We know that it is increased in expression when muscles are undergoing resistance training in animals. One interesting thing, which is probably true of a lot of these signaling pathways, is that administration of IGF as a sort of treatment or a way to affect muscle mass is not really effective in a normal human. So if you took a normal human who did not have disease or have a reason to have muscle atrophy and gave them IGF, you aren't going to get hypertrophy. That's, of course, in direct contrast to something like growth hormone, which does su support that. However, if you take an animal with muscle deficiencies for whatever reason and you supplement them with IGF, you can actually counteract that atrophy. mTOR is another uh, uh, men member in this family. It is downstream of your IGF-1, so you can see it there in the middle. It's also responsible through a uh, signaling cascade to promote muscle protein synthesis. It does play a critical role and it is the main regulator of protein synthesis. Interestingly enough, in contrast to um, IGF, you can actually stimulate mTOR with nutrition. So it has another uh, factor to um, create a, a signaling cascade. It results in phosphorylation of the S6K1 and 4EBP1, which are also downstream to the IGF as well. This activates your ribosomal protein S6, which then results in synthesis of protein. Again, mTOR can be synthesized by IGF-1 or activated by IGF-1, but it also can be activated by nutrition. And this other player, phosphatidic acid, may also play a role. We know that there is actually crosstalk uh, with muscle when muscle atrophy occurs between triggers in muscle atrophy, such as myostatin and glucocorticoids. So that leads us to discussing the signal pathways of atrophy. And so what is the cause of, uh, what are the regulators of muscle atrophy. So we have a couple key players. Ubiquitin proteasome pathway has been noted and then myostatin which we've mentioned a couple times and we're going to get into that a little bit more. 
So your proteasome pathway, um, your ubiquitin proteasome pathway is likely responsible for the majority of non-lysosomal protein degradation. This is considered to be a multi-component system that actually targets proteins for destruction. So it identifies proteins that should be broken down by tagging them. It does this with three distinct enzymes. Now there are three categories, but there are multiple of these that can do this. You have your ubiquitin activating, ubiquitin conjugating, and your ubiquitin ligating enzymes. This particular ubiquitin pathway is inhibited again by IGF. The, that's the same pathway that we've already talked about. Also interestingly, uh, you can see upregulation of ubiquitin in resistance. So they looked at uh, some animals that were undergoing, uh, they were hunting animals, so they were English pointers and golden retrievers. They looked at these dogs during preseason, during their uh, hunting season, and then also um, when they were detraining, and they appreciated an increase in ubiquitin during peak hunting season. So that's a little bit interesting because you would think that as these animals are doing more exercise and more to improve their muscle cross-sectional area that you wouldn't necessarily have this uh, mechanism in place to uh, for atrophy. What they think is happening is that it's because it's there's increased proteolysis of muscle during, uh, during exercise and there's increased need for repair, that they're actually upregulating this ubiquitin. So that's part of that pathway is actually in the healing of those um, muscles and why they're seeing that upregulation. They also noted that there was an increase in mRNA levels of these genes encoding ubiquitin in those same animals. So again, that speaks to that it may play some role in the repair cycle um, with muscle training and, and uh, endurance. And then finally, sort of the, the big piece that we're talking about today um, is myostatin. I really like this, this graphic because I think it's the most simplified version of all of these different pathways. Um, I would probably add IGF up there with the growth factor uh, or growth hormone, I mean, with the growth factor as a potential stimulator of these. But your left-hand side of this graph is basically showing the pathways that contribute to turning translation on and myogenesis. You also can see clearly that there's some proteins that are that are used for protein or some signals that are used for protein degradation. So we didn't really talk about your Mur F1 and your MAF BX, but those are both inhibitory to this uh, upstream of the mTOR, and they actually promote protein degradation. And ubiquitin plays a role with those as well. So that's part of the ubiquitin proteasome pathway. And then on the right-hand side, you have myostatin, which works through the SMAD2 pathway. To It's a growth control mechanism. So it's actually inhibiting these uh, protein factors, myOD and myogen, uh, to prevent myogenesis. So myostatin, as we just said, it blocks the differentiation genes, myogenin and myOD. It also potentially blocks some other, uh, other gene differentiation gene factors that play a role in muscle growth. We think that it's likely more important in, in inhibition of hypertrophy rather than preventing atrophy, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. We know that during embryo knowledge, em, the formation of the embryo and in postnatally, it plays a huge role in the number of muscle fibers uh, that are present. The reason that this particular biomarker got a lot of attention is because there are some spontaneous occurrences of myostatin deficiency in nature. The ones that we probably remember the most as veterinarians are gonna be your bully whippet and your double muscled cattle. So the bully whippet is actually um, has a two base pair deletion in the myostatin gene compared to the double muscled cattle that have an 11 base pair deletion. In order to have the double muscled phenotype, you must have two copies of that gene. Uh, the single carriers are generally more muscular and significantly faster than the uh, double carriers in the whippet. And so that's sort of what they breed for. There are also mice that have had myostatin gene knocked out. That's done experimentally, so it's not necessarily naturally occurring, but that is something that we, an animal model that we have looked at with myostatin deficiency. 
Again, our bully whippet has has a header, all three types. You can have your regular and then you can have your double muscled, but what they really want in terms of racing is the heterozygote myostatin deficient um, animal because that's gonna be moderately improved in muscle and there have been studies that indicate that this improves their uh, racing efficiency. So we're gonna conclude uh, with, with a discussion on why we care and why these mechanisms really matter. Well, the reason is because when my, myostatin was first identified in 1997 and it was associated with cachexia, secondary to diseases such as cancer, HIV, and heart failure. And so because we had these natural occurring um, myostatin deficient animals with increased muscle and we were able to identify that myostatin was associated with cachexia of these serious diseases, it became a potential target for therapeutics and nutraceuticals. The question became, can we improve or decrease sarcopenia and cachexia? Can we you know, improve neurogenic uh, or disuse muscle atrophy? And then of course, Beyond the scope of this talk, there's a whole performance enhancing discussion. If you were to Google myostatin inhibitor just on a regular Google, the first thing that comes up is tons and tons of products, nutraceuticals that can inhibit your myostatin and make you a bodybuilder. So that is, um, again, beyond the scope of this uh, discussion, but it is out there as a possible use. So myostatin and these diseases, so primarily what we would look at in veterinary medicine is cachexia and sarcopenia. It's important to note a slight difference between these two um, muscle wasting describing terms. So your cachexia is really going to speak to overall loss of body mass, secondary to disease process, whereas sarcopenia typically re refers to age-related muscle loss that can or cannot be in the absence of disease. And so what happens in your older patients, your older dogs, is that they actually get a 25% reduction in cross-sectional area of their type 2 fibers, where their type 1 fibers are relatively unchanged. The reason that that's important is if you can remember way back at the beginning of this talk, we talked about our type 1 fibers being more susceptible to atrophy. So here is an example uh, of specific muscle wasting that is different. So it's affecting, this muscle atrophy is affecting different types of uh, motor of muscle fibers. We also need to think about the fact that some of this loss of muscle fiber in sarcopenia may be secondary to lack of motor neurons. It's thought to, that they are um, not as strong, not as effective, and, and kind of die off as a dog, as an animal gets older, and so that certainly is playing a role. Oops, sorry. Um, so what has been done looking at sarcopenia and myostatin in medicine? So there actually is, there are quite a few studies. I just picked a few, so to not belabor this point. Um, but essentially the data is a little bit mixed at this point. There was a study that uh, was published just five years ago in skeletal muscle by Bergen et al. looking at a population of older adults, both male and female. When they looked at just the older women, 34% uh, of them had higher circulating concentrations of myostatin when you compared that to the younger women. When they looked at the younger men compared to the younger women, the men had two times higher relative levels of myostatin. When they looked at older women and sarcopenic women, the sarcopenic they had higher myostatin compared to the corresponding cohort of men. And so it begs the question as to, does myostatin have a different role in men versus women? Is it potentially more a homeostatic regulator for muscle in men and contributing to sarcopenia in women? I don't know that we know the answer to that. That particular study was actually looking at circulating levels of myostatin. Another study that was actually looking at mRNA expression showed that the mRNA expression of myostatin was about 30% lower in a population without sarcopenia. We also know that there's been some work, actually most extensive work on cachexia and myostatin. Again, remember that this is diffuse loss of body weight as a, as a consequence of pathological changes in your metabolic pathways. We know that cachexia definitely contributes to increased mortality and mor uh, morbidity. It is mediated by several pro-inflammatory cytokines, including IL-1, TNF-alpha, and IL-6. 
TNF alpha actually also stimulates another atrophy signaling, signaling cascade that I chose not to review in this particular lecture because I thought it would add too much time. But do know that part of, in addition to being a pro-inflammatory cytokine, it also has a cascade of atrophy um, that it, it contributes to. Again, this ends up being an imbalance in protein synthesis and degradation. Um, we do know that myostatin plays a role. Again, this was where this was first discovered. Uh, there's a lot of work looking into this as a potential therapeutic target, most commonly in um, cachexia related to cirrhosis of the liver. In terms of some of the other causes that we discussed of muscle atrophy, disuse muscle atrophy, again, this is gonna be your decrease in fiber diameter. This affects both the cross-sectional area and then subsequently the force of your contraction. In disuse muscle atrophy, we know there's reduced capacity of uh, mitochondria. We know there's reduced capillary, so uh, reduced oxygenation. And what we don't know exactly is the role of myostatin in that disuse muscle atrophy. We know um, that it has been indicated that it increases during muscle atrophy, um, but the exact mechanism of action is not completely elucidated. It does have, seem to have some correlation with the ubiquitin um, interplay there between those two pathways. And then there's neurogenic atrophy, which also has shown variable degrees of myostatin serum. So uh, not sure exactly what this role is. It has been noted that upregulation of serum myostatin occurs in neuromuscular diseases, um, but the concern is that it actually more reflects disease tissue rather than muscle loss. And so what does that mean in terms of a therapeutic agent um, or some sort of nutraceutical that can help in this? I don't know that we know yet. Interestingly enough, there is a particular type of uh, golden retriever, or actually it's, it's pretty much any dog, but it's primarily seen in golden retrievers, uh, of a muscular dystrophy that is noted. It's pretty rare. It's not very commonly seen. Probably most of you won't see this in your lifetime. It's a sex-linked muscular dystrophy that is caused by a dystrophin uh, mutation, and the dystrophin is what stabilizes your cell muscle membrane. Um, again, it's primarily seen in golden retrievers, but it's also seen in Labradors and a few other breeds. Your primary clinical signs are going to be prehension difficulty, uh, which is mostly secondary to the inability to open the jaw because of muscle atrophy. You tend to have diffuse atrophy in the axial and, and other appendicular muscles with hypertrophy of the sartorius muscle. The reason behind that, they think, is because some of these animals also experience altered joint kinematics, and so they believe that that is causing a hypertrophy of that sartorius. The atrophy diffusely results in weakness. You can diagnose this by looking at blood work. These animals often have, actually they usually always have elevated CK. They sometimes have an elevated ALT and AST. That's primarily mediated by the significant uh, fibrosis, muscle fibrosis and necrosis that's occurring. And then if you wanted a definitive diagnosis, you would get that through muscle biopsy. This model actually became a naturally occurring disease model for human Duchenne muscular dystrophy. This is a disease that affects young boys. It's extremely debilitating and with a high mortality rate. So the idea that there was a naturally occurring model, animal model, that they could do work and study um, the treatments and, and progression of disease in was, was actually really good. So there is a purpose-bred colony of these dogs. They have investigated myostatin as a treatment for the severe fibrosis and atrophy that occurs in this, in this disease. They actually took those bully whippets and thought, what if we could inhibit, what if we could genetically pass along this inhibition or myostatin deficiency to these affected golden retrievers, what would happen? So they crossed the whippet with the golden retriever carriers and they did two serial, I won't get into the genetics of this, but the second uh, progeny were called grippets. Unfortunately, this resulted in progression of fibrosis, muscle contracture. They had decreased joint angles and a much worse um, mortality rate. The thought of this is that, again, this really speaks to the complicated signaling cascade and regulation of myogenesis. And so we often identify these biomarkers as potential um, areas of treatment, um, but we have to do so cautiously and carefully because they are very complicated and you know, not as straightforward as, as one would think. Most likely the effect of this was because the, the muscles actually are fibrosing. So it's not the same as you know, atrophy, that there's, there's just a change in the type of fiber that exists in those muscles. 
So that brings us to um, the end of our, our conversation where we're gonna talk about current research in myostatin and disease. Just for your fun information, if you actually go to the clinicaltrials.gov website and put in myostatin, you'll see that there are 87 trials currently listed, either ongoing or um, recruiting for research. Some of those dis some of those diseases that they're looking at are um, the more common muscular dystrophies in humans. The, there are two pharmaceutical agents or inhibitors of myostatin that have actually gone through um, clinical trials. The, the first did not show any efficacy, and the second had to be stopped in the phase two clinical trials because of uh, adverse side effects. Um, but despite that, it is still a heavily looked at target for therapy. In veterinary medicine, we are fortunate enough to have a supplement that is used to help inhibit myostatin and hopefully prevent disuse muscle atrophy. Um, there is some research being done on this particular uh, substance. Uh, so fortitropin, which is made by our sponsors today, is a uh, fertilized egg yolk that is designed to inhibit myostatin and hopefully inhibit muscle atrophy. One study that was just recently hot off the presses uh, published is uh, uh, looking at disuse muscle atrophy in relation to tibial plateau or TPLO uh, surgery, obviously the most common um, orthopedic injury that we see. This was a great study looking at prospective randomized uh, placebo-controlled clinical trial. They had 100 client-owned dogs. They had a treatment group that received once daily fortitropin for 12 weeks. This was mixed with food. They had data that was obtained at baseline or day zero, eight weeks and 12 weeks. And then um, there was a gradual return to activity after the, um, after the eight weeks of restriction. They looked at thigh circumference, musculoskeletal ultrasound um, of both the thigh girth and apaxial muscles. They evaluated serum myostatin. They looked at percent weight bearing. Um, and so those were their objective measures. This study showed that there was no change in thigh circumference in your treatment group. So um, while initially that is confusing, basically your placebo group had a significant atrophy where the treatment group did not. This was also true when you look at the myostatin levels. So the serum myostatin levels in the fortitropin treatment group stayed the same as pre-surgery, whereas there was a rise in myostatin in the placebo group. This is, again, supportive of everything we've sort of already talked about and how these signaling cascades work is that fortitropin supplementation seems to be best used in preventing disuse atrophy rather than promoting hypertrophy as a supplement. Um, obviously, the naturally occurring animals contradict that, but as a target or a, a biomarker or therapeutic target, it seems to be most effective in prevention of disuse atrophy. So this is a great study um, to help uh, support the use of this particular supplement. And then uh, I'm, I'm also working on a study looking at pharmacodynamics of a single low or high dose uh, of fortitropin in dogs. The reason that we wanted to do this is that we are often asked in our field for recommendations on um, supplements. And I think it's really important that we have good answers for our clients. And so how do we tell someone that we believe in a supplement or think that it's a good supplement? Well, for one, we want to make sure that they're doing research in the species that they're recommending this dog and that they're showing efficacy. Something as simple as showing whether the drug gets to where it needs to go or is having the effect that it's supposed to have is, is you know, very easy research to do, but important and really is not done by many, many of these supplements that are highly unregulated. So I think it's really wonderful that they that this company has invested in doing this research. We also uh, chose to do this uh, as a prospective randomized double blind uh, crossover study. We used adult healthy dogs. We looked at a single dose of low dose fortitropin and or high dose fortitropin and then we paired that with an equivalent uh, control. We collected blood samples at baseline then 18, 36, 48 and 72 hours after. Um, and we are in the process of analyzing this data. Unfortunately, the COVID epidemic has sort of slowed that down. There's some samples I need to resend to those that are analyzing them, and I haven't been able to do that in this current situation, but we hope to have that information. Um, again, this is really important information for a supplement that you're recommending uh, to be able to speak to whether it does what it says it's going to do in various uh, situations. 
And then finally, where do we go from here? So again, I think myostatin continues to be a very important biomarker for disease. I think that we need to establish normal myostatin levels in healthy versus senior um, versus geriatric uh, pets and kind of have an idea of what that means. And then potentially, can we compare serum myostatin levels to muscle mass? They did do that to some extent in the TPLO study. There was a little bit of contradiction in results in that their thigh circumference was affected, but their musculoskeletal ultrasound did not change. Um, and so certainly musculoskeletal ultrasound, I think, is actually a more validated approach for evaluating muscle than thigh circumference has been. Um, but potentially, you know, with a larger study or different population of animals or even looking at normal animals and muscle mass, that's uh, another place that we can continue to investigate. Here's a list of very many, many references. There's probably way more than that. Um, and then if there are any questions, this is my cat. This is what working from home looks like with a cat. Um, I'm going to go ahead and open up the Q&A and uh, we'll be here for uh, about 10 or 15 minutes more to allow for questions. Um, thank you very much for listening to my webinar. I hope that it was helpful information um, and we are now open to questions. If you have any questions, comments, doesn't have to be a profound question. Can I list the references? Yes, um, let me go back to references, sorry. It's very tiny writing, but there are, that's the reference slide, yes. <laughs> um, thank you, uh, very helpful. I was curious where the photo of your favorite patient was with the zip line set up. So that was um, in Raleigh, North Carolina. That was at Dr. Sherman's clinic. It was called VetHab Rehabilitation. Um, he actually, my husband actually built that zip line. He was not my husband at the time, but um, he built that zip line and um, set that up for, for that dog secret. Um, is the myostatin oral supplement available and what is it called? Yes, it certainly is. It's called Fortitropin. Um, you can get that on, um, I believe on Amazon and also, um, I think that's the primary place where they, uh, where they sell it. Um, any adverse effects with fortitropin and are you currently recommending this in patients at AMC? Great questions. Um, so far, it's a very, very well tolerated. Um, we actually had more issues with my placebo group than I did. Actually, I had no issues with the um, fortitropin group, only with the, the placebo. Um, so, and yes, we do recommend it quite frequently for our um, sarcopenic patients. Again, I think it's, you know, it's because the side effects are are none and we've not seen any side effects. There is some work and some interest in looking into potentially what might, what might happen since it is a, technically a protein. Um, you might wanna use it cautiously with your kidney failure patients. Um, we certainly use it with them, uh, but we're also usually, those animals are on NSAIDs, so we're closely monitoring their, um, their values anyway, but I would use it cautiously. There's some work in the pipeline to look at safety with kidney patients, but that would be my only concern. Um, is there a PDF of your slides? Uh, no, but I can maybe um, send you the send you that if you would like. Um, can this product be helpful with muscle atrophy associated with OA? So we don't know the answer to that yet, right? Because there's actually not been a study on it. So the 100% answers we don't know. Stay tuned. Hopefully we'll be doing more work with uh, Myos to determine that. Um, but in principle, potentially. Are there any contradictions? Um, yeah, so I kind of talked about that. Um, you would want to use this cautiously with your um, uh, kidney, kidney patients um, just to make sure that you know, you're not causing an issue. We don't believe that there's an issue, but it is a protein. Um, we have certainly used it safely um, to uh, safely in animals that have early kidney disease without issue or without causing elevation in those values. But I would just caution you with that. Um, can you pl explain myofascial trigger points? Um, potentially, but let me make sure I answer everybody's myostatin related questions. Um, myostatin serum levels analyzed. So we don't, we actually worked with Dr. Harkin to have our myostatin uh, evaluated. There are some um, research organizations out there that can do it. Um, and this primarily using, so what I can say primarily using this, the, the question is, are you primarily using this product post-op for post-op orthopedics? Um, so the true 100% answer is as a, as a 
resident in training, my job is to follow the evidence. So the evidence at this point is supportive of use in post-op orthopedics. We definitely use it in our clinic for our sarcopenic and geriatric patients all the time. I don't have a study yet to prove that's effective for them. So, um, and again, we don't know, and it may not be as effective because some of those as we discussed, those signaling cascades are different depending on the cause of the muscle atrophy. So from a scientific standpoint, we definitely recommend this for post-op orthopedic cases, but we may um, be um, doing um, studies on other diseases. Um, Dr. A, I don't actually know. So my mentor is on here and she just asked me a question about fortitropin with pancreatitis. Um, I actually don't know if it's been associated with pancreatitis, not in my clinical experience, but maybe you are thinking of something that I don't remember. Um, and then, yes, so a uh, great question about research with feline patients. Yep, that's part of what people are looking into, especially with our um, kidney, kidney cats. Could this help them? Um, I wanna make sure, hopefully I didn't miss any questions. Um, I think, I think that was it. Um, oh, <laughs> somebody from Raleigh, North Carolina, Waffle says hi. That's uh, one of my uh, patients when I was a student at NC State. That's awesome. Hi, Vicki. I'm so glad you were on here. That's awesome. Um, all right. Any other questions, concerns, thoughts that people want to share? I'll give you a couple more minutes to ask away. Um, while I'm doing that, someone had asked about myofascial trigger points. Um, I'm not sure what exactly you mean by that, um, but certainly dogs that have muscle disease can have um, myofascial trigger points uh, and we treat them through massage and stretch um, and uh, sometimes dry needling. So these are essentially similar to what happens to you when you've been at your computer all day. The muscle gets knotted and tight um, and sort of contracted. And so that's, that's what um, you're dressing with those. And then it looks like there were some chats too. Um, Um, let's see. Do you think the effect, okay, so you reference complex interplay between hormones activity level and among other things, nutrition. Do you think the effects of fortitropin would be different in patients on different diets? Um, that's a great question. I think that fortitropin's effect is actually going to be different depending on the cause of the atrophy. I think that's more significant. Um, most of our patients, at least veterinary patients, are on you know, well-balanced diets. So there's not a huge difference between those nutrients in our patients. So I don't think that that would make a difference. Certainly if perhaps you got into some of the um, hypoallergenic or the protein and phosphorus restricted diets, but even still those are formulated to be well-balanced. So I would assume that it, it wouldn't make a difference. Again, I think the primary reason that fortitropin is going to be effective or not is based on the underlying cause of the atrophy. Um, yeah, and so let's see. I think that is all our, um, yeah, so the, someone made a comment about fortitropin not being a protein, and, and so it is a fertilized egg membrane protein. Um, so that was one of the things that often makes people worried about using it in um, our kidney cat, in our kidney ant pets. Um, but I will say that uh, our internal medicine specialists at the AMC have been you know, very accommodating to that and not really concerned about it. All right, let me go back to the other place, make sure we got everything. Um, okay. Has there been any, oh, this is a great question and a very loaded one that I don't have the answer to, but is there any benefit, any correlation with intact animals versus non-intact animals with the benefit of fortitropin? Um, that is a great question. It's something that I think we definitely need to um, look into. Uh, we don't know that in our veterinary patients right now. Uh, Obviously, a lot of our veterinary patients are already neutered, especially the ones that are going to be entering these clinical trials. Um, so that is something that I'm interested in looking at is can we identify differences? We know in the, some of those human studies, there have been differences between men and women. So I think that is a great question and something hopefully we can look into. 
Um, okay, so and then they clarified the MTRP is the role of myostatin. Um, I don't think that myostatin would play a role in, trigger, in myofascial trigger points. Um, that would just be based on my understanding of how it works. I don't know that it would be something that would help treat those. Um, and then Dr. Alvarez, my mentor is chiming in. So um, less the protein is the concern, but more the phosphorus. And they did analyze the phosphor, phosphorus level um, and it's low uh, per doses of the label. So that's good information for everybody to have. All right. It seems like that is all the questions. Um, I'm going to go ahead and end this seminar. If you guys have questions, um, certainly reach out to Myos. They have my contact information. I'm happy to provide references or more information. Um, and I really appreciate everybody joining this meeting today. And I hope that it was helpful. And uh, enjoy the rest of your day and stay safe, everybody. And um, have a great, great day. <laughs>